Okay, this video is iron part two about iron in your health. And this one is going to focus on the diseases caused by excessive iron. So this is the pathophysiology of iron. We're gonna talk a little bit about the Fenton reaction, the Haber-Weiss reaction and oxidative stress, mechanisms by which iron goes into redox cycling, uh, freeing up electrons to bind with oxygen and generate reactive oxygen species which can turn into hydroxyl radical. A uh, free radical is a molecule that has an unpaired electron in its outer orbital, and those can damage tissue. So I'm gonna kind of go into complexity, you know, dive, so to speak, into complexity. I'll, I'll come back. I'll try to keep it all clear for you. And the bottom line is this. People, the vast majority of people in middle age become progressively more iron overloaded, and it starts causing damage all over the place in their bodies. And so once you realize that, you can start to lower it, get it under control, improve your health. Okay, so iron is good when it's doing its job, working with enzymes and hemoglobin. It's bad when it's free and it's auto-catalyzing free radicals. When transferrin, the iron transport in the blood, as saturation, amount of filling with iron goes above 60%, you get progressively more NTBI, non-transferrin bound iron in the blood, and that causes all sorts of problems. So the double nature of iron has been called the angel and the devil by Laufer. And the best metaphor is the one by Weinberg in his book, um, this book right here, Hidden Dangers of Iron. And he calls it like a fire in your house, good in the stove and furnace, but bad everywhere else. Okay. All right. Ferrous redox cycling is the term, you know, ferrous for iron redox for reduction, oxidation reaction cycling going back and forth. And in that process, electrons given off and they're gonna generate these hydroxyl radicals, which are very damaging to the human body. They can undergo lipid peroxidation, trash our plasma membranes and our mitochondrial membranes. There's even a type of cell death due to iron-related lipid peroxidation called ferroptosis. Okay, here's a picture just to give you a sense of what it looks like. So, the Fe2 plus can cycle back and forth from Fe2 plus to Fe3 plus, Fe2 plus to Fe3 plus. The Haber-Weiss reaction over here, the Fenton reaction over here. And so this can be autocatalytic. You don't even need an enzyme. Without an enzyme, this just happens. And all these hydroxyl radicals are generated. And the hydroxyl radicals go and they just start destroying things, destroying membranes. Uh, they can destroy DNA. You really want to minimize this in your human body. And the best way to minimize it is avoid iron as much as you can. And if you find yourself kind of sick and worried about it, uh, then you're probably going to need to donate blood. Check that out with your doctor, of course, but you will see that's what all the experts recommend that have studied this. Um, you can generate hydrogen peroxide, H2O2, from mitochondrial uh, loss of electrons, superoxide, as well as from oxidase-type enzymes, okay? So that's the key thing on this, this slide. You, the thing you need to know from this is iron cycles, ferrous redox cycling, and that generates free radicals, okay? In particular, hydroxyl radical that damages tissue. That you need to know. Okay, here's just a little more detail. When you write a free radical, you just put a dot next to it, and the dot represents an unpaired electron in the outer orbital of the molecule. Um, this is from a previous recent lecture I gave on oxidative stress. So I'll just show you the Fenton reaction. That's the most important one to know about. So you can remember the first two letters of Fenton are Fe. So that reminds you of, uh, you know, iron and the iron is a key thing and it's going to generate OH. I think of the N having two downstrokes and that reminds you it's Fe2 plus in the beginning of the reaction. If you care to remember that, you don't need to know that for our purposes, but I'm just showing you how I'll remember a reaction. And then knowing that it comes up with OH, I'll just look at the O, and the N reminds me a little bit of an H, and so I, so I can remember the reaction from that. You know, Fe, iron, 2 plus, generates OH radical, okay? So that's what the Fenton reaction does. And these hydroxyl radicals, like the OH here, I made it in red to stand out for it's the big dangerous thing. That goes around damaging your tissue. Um, Here's just a picture of what happens in context. You've got electron transport and something is blocking the passage of electrons and electron transport for whatever the reason. Most commonly it's high fat, fat will block complex three, and then it'll start to go backwards and electrons drop down onto this oxygen. Instead of doing its job to take electrons over here, four electrons, and become water and ATP be generated, the oxygen is diverted uh, because these 
parts of the, these parts of the electron transport chain in the inner mitochondrial membrane are not getting their electrons. And then it'll just get a single electron here and it'll become superoxide. And that will sometimes uh, lead to a cascade of reactions ending up in the Fenton reaction generating hydroxyl radical and that'll start to trash uh, the membrane, for example, inner mitochondrial membrane. So that's just the context of what's happening inside the body, for example, in um, side of a mitochondria, but it also happens inside the blood when there's free iron in the blood. We talked about that, NTBI, non-transferring bound iron. It also happens in the colon. Whenever iron's free, it causes trouble. It's like bouncing a Super Bowl around, Super Ball around, and it just randomly smashes into things and breaks stuff. It's it's bad. Okay, uh, these are spots. You've seen them on a person's hand. You'll sometimes see them on people's faces. They look like giant freckles, about a half inch in diameter, a little bigger, a little smaller. They're called lipofuscin spots, aging spots, or liver spots. And just letting you know that that's associated with excessive sun exposure, but it's also associated with uh, being iron overloaded. Uh, really tends to make that a lot worse. So what I'm saying is iron accelerates your aging. Um, iron, when it's present in overloaded amounts, it'll tend to get into the joints and worsen arthritis. Chondrocalcinosis means calcification, for example, in the cartilage, the menisci of the knee joints. I see that pretty commonly. Um, so it's one of those things contributing to arthritis. So it's always like a major cause of arthritis, for example, which I think is primarily high fat diet, but there's all the secondary causes. There's trauma, there's iron overload as well. It's also damaging the sperm. So if you're worried about infertility, it's another reason to lower your iron levels. Okay, starving a fever. You've all heard that thing, starve a fever. Where might that idea have come from? Does it have any validity? Lalford, an iron biochemist at Harvard, he basically says he thinks it has to go along with the idea of depriving a bacterial infection of iron. And, you know, if you, and he claims that fewer women died during the Black Plague in medieval Europe because women had lower iron levels. Okay, <laughs> that's a theory. That's a theory. All right. Oral contraceptives uh, might increase the risk of infections because a woman will accumulate higher total body iron storage because she's not menstruating that much. High liver iron tends to feed viruses like uh, viral liver infections, hepatitis, HPV is hepatitis B virus, and that'll increase the risk of liver cancer. A lot of research has been done on that area. We're going to go into all this in more detail, but I'm sort of just highlighting some key points about the dangers of iron. Okay. Um, Oh, so the human body holds iron to control infections, and, you know, that's analogous to the human female holds withholds sex to control marriage. Okay, stupid joke. Okay, when blood pH is even slightly acidic, transferrin is less able to bind to iron. That's kind of another thing that's a little bit of a big deal because that whole increased bodily acidity is down that path of increased carcinogenicity, increasing cancer risk. So you see where I'm going with this. Cancer cells need iron. They need it in a big way to grow. So things that are making you more acidic are also freeing up more iron to be free in the blood and to potentially go uh, to cancer cells. All right, iron deficiency and anemia, it tends to be overdiagnosed. It's normal for a woman to have a lower hemoglobin. Where exactly to set that, you know, is a little bit arbitrary. It depends. We're not going to get into too much, but just be aware, according to all the, you know, world famous biochemists that spend their life studying iron, they think that iron deficiency anemia is way over diagnosed in premenopausal women and they're over treated with iron supplements. So we're not going to go into all that, but just be aware that if that's an issue for you or someone that you help, um, you might want to read about that. Okay, primary hemochromatosis is just a genetic abnormality. It's also called hereditary hemochromatosis, abbreviated HHC. And these are patients who absorb too much iron. So let's say if they're homozygous, meaning that from their mother and father, both copies of the gene, HO, HHC, they'll tend to be, um, be diagnosed by symptoms. Their transfer and saturation will tend to be over 62%, which is very high. And they'll be absorbing about four times too much iron. Okay, and the, you know, according to Laufer, he thinks it's way more common than is widely recognized. He thinks it's present in as many as one out of 200 persons. Others say, you know, maybe in the ballpark of one out of 500 persons. Still, relatively common disease. Person can be heterozygous, meaning they got one copy of the gene from one of their parents, but the other gene from the other parent is not uh, of the abnormal hemochromatosis type. So that's abbreviated HZ, HHC. So heterozygous, hereditary hemochromatosis. Okay. 
and that occurs in you know more than 10 percent of the population okay so they'll absorb more iron than they should but not as much as the homozygous version that has both parents that got it from both parents um, the hz heterozygous uh, carrier type so to speak they'll tend to have high normal iron levels that are bad for their health but not overtly frankly at a young age making them very sick so the the problems that one sees with uh, homozygous, you know, the more severe form of hemochromatosis is they tend to get liver cirrhosis. That means failure of the liver due to excessive scarring and destruction of tissue. And that makes sense because the liver is a major site for iron storage in the body. Um, that can be assessed with a special type of MRI, T2 star, or the liver biopsy. If they think the person has hereditary hemochromatosis. Uh, increased risk of liver cancer by 200 fold okay so pretty high risk and really these people want to lower their iron levels in a big way the Mayo Clinic actually has a clinic for hemochromatosis uh, that's you know and the topic for another day all that but the bottom line is knowing how to avoid iron is what we care about for our purposes in this lecture skin pigmentation it turns sort of bronze like brownish and that's why it's going to be called bronze disease, and in particular, it strongly uh, is associated with damage to the pancreatic beta cells. The beta cells are the ones that make insulin. So hemochromatosis is often called bronze diabetes, and the person will look like they're suntan. Uh, but, and sort of the point I'm making here between the lines is hereditary hemochromatosis is an accelerated form of iron absorption. So they get all these iron problems at a younger age, more severely, faster. But Another person who's iron overloaded, they don't have it as severe and as young of an onset, but they're also damaging these same organ systems. They're damaging their liver. They're damaging uh, their pancreatic beta cells, drifting into you know, liver failure, drifting into uh, pancreas failure, which is type 2 diabetes, insulin dependent. And so that's what I'm saying is once you recognize all this stuff is damaging your body, you learn to avoid it. Um, the pituitary gland also gets infiltrated with iron, especially the anterior pituitary, and that can cause hypogonadism, meaning a lack of uh, hormone production, which can lead to loss of libido. It can even lead to impotence. We talked about it uh, going into the joints and affecting the cartilage, and that causes arthritis. It also accumulates, the iron does, within the skeletal muscles, I'm sorry, within the cardiac muscle cells, and that can lead to congestive heart failure, can also lead to arrhythmia. So if you've got atrial fibrillation, for example, this could make it worse. Um, and so, you know, getting back to the pancreas and having the beta cells destroyed, the way I think of these things is you're destroying the beta cells by eating a high fat diet. Okay. So that's one major problem. You're destroying beta cells by eating oils because those undergo lipid peroxidation. We talked about the Yamashima research. Okay. Um, and now you're also destroying beta cells from eating the meat with the high iron or the fortified foods, all the processed food. So all this stuff, think of them as poisons. And the reason why you want to think of meat and vegetable oils and processed food as poisons, so then you will avoid it. Because you know, I know the average you know, person in this country, I've talked to tons of them, they all have this sort of mentality. They, they, they know social skills. Hi, how you doing? Nice to see you. When in Rome, do as the Romans do. Go with the flow. And for social skills, that works. That's what you want. But nutrition is not like that. Nutrition is avoid everything bad. Not one bite of meat, not one sip of dairy, not one drop of oil. That's how a person starts to improve their health and, and starts to win the game of health. All this stuff in moderation is for idiots and losers. Stay away from it, okay? It doesn't work. Uh, you don't, like people say, you know, uh, everything in moderation on your plate. No, put good food on both sides of your plate. Your entire plate should be just good food. Only eat good stuff. None of this, you know, eat half good food and half bad food. No, that's stupid. Okay. I, I make a big deal about that because if a person doesn't get that, they don't get better. You know, again, that's why I like McDougal and Esselstyn. Their patients get better. Most patients don't get better. Don't think most people age well. Most people age poorly. Most people, they're mentally slow. They're sick. They're fat. They're on a bunch of pills. They're going for surgeries, and they and they talk about it like, oh, isn't it sad? And actually, it's because they're ignorant. Okay, and. Not always. There's some people who have really bad luck and unfortunate things happen. But I'm saying the vast majority of people, they age poorly because they're ignorant and they keep, you know, eating fish and chicken and olive oil and cooking with oil and all this stuff. And they just, okay. Not a day goes by that I don't see a whole bunch of strokes, uh, myocardial infarction complications, um, 
all kinds of disasters, you know, diabetic complications, amputations, all these, you know, dementias in, in relatively young people. It's sad, okay? And so that's why we, we study all this so we can avoid all that in ourselves, okay? All right, this is just another slide showing the, the metabolism of iron. We, we covered that in the previous lecture, okay? A couple points about iron in the liver. Because it's a major storage site for iron within ferritin, it's one of the earlier, more severely damaged sites with iron ac accumulation. And the liver is another spot where you got synergistic toxins. Number one, the high fat diet is causing, causing fatty liver. Number two, alcohol causes fatty liver, plus alcohol is a direct toxin to the liver. Okay, number three, this iron is toxic to the liver. So you're damaging the liver from multiple directions. Also that glyphosate from the non-organic food, that's toxic, okay? All of these things are ramping up liver damage and so they're, you know, these patients, it's now becoming the most common cause, one of the most common causes. used to be just alcoholism. Nowadays, a lot of people are ending up in liver failure from just fatty liver progressing to liver fibrosis, progressing to liver cirrhosis, progressing to full-blown liver failure requiring liver transplant or getting liver cancer and dying from it. Um, Okay, uh, it used to be that I thought, you know, many years ago when I was a young guy in training, we kept seeing more and more hepatitis causing liver failure, and hepatitis was, you know, a, a pathway to death. But nowadays, the hepatitis patients are living longer, and the patients are, you know, more often what I'm seeing going into liver failure from all this fatty liver stuff, combined, of course, with the alcohol, combined, of course, with the iron overloading. So we talked about potentiators of liver disease the dietary iron, the excess dietary fat, if they've got hemochromatosis. The meat's really bad, like I said, because you absorb a lot more of the heme iron. Okay, um, I haven't specifically looked up soy, but soy is a weird food. It's got heme iron in it as well, so I don't know for sure. I'll bet you it's absorbed in large amounts, but I have not specifically studied that. Um, fatty liver, we talked about that. Alcohol makes it all worse. And then if the person does have hepatitis, hepatitis B and hep C, they're pretty common infections. Okay, iron cookware in the Bantus in South Africa, they were known for their iron working skills and they used to cook with iron pans and they used to make beer in iron containers and you know, you'd have a normal healthy meal with 20 milligrams a day being the amount of iron in their diet and that would be bumped up to 200 milligrams a day from the cookware. So cookware with iron in it uh, can really crank up uh, iron amounts in the food. So that's good to know. Once they stop doing that, their, their problem really improved a lot. Okay, blood transfusion. <clears throat> blood transfusion, <clears throat> excuse me, overloads a person with iron. And if a person needs it, you know, they need it. But, you know, that has been a common thing for decades. Everybody wondered, how come blood transfusions don't work as well as expected? Why do patients often have problems? And there's a lot of reasons. Number one, they're getting dumped on with a big load of iron, about 250 milligrams per unit of packed red blood cells. And that accumulates. So these patients who get received multiple transfusions, they get iron overloaded. Um, the repeat blood transfusions will overload them with iron. Um, you know, there's some diseases where they need it because they, they don't have enough oxygen carrying capacity. Uh, what else? Uh, transfer and saturation when it gets above 60%, you know, you start getting free iron in the blood. So they'll have a lot of problems with reactive oxygen. It's very much, you know, like there's hereditary hemochromatosis. This is really in a sense, secondary hemochromatosis meaning that primary hemochromatosis is due to something heredity from your body itself. Secondary means from some external cause, in this case, from the blood transfusions. So number one, you can get iron overloaded if you have repeat transfusions. You tend to do that. We talked about secondary hemochromatosis. Number three, there's often dormant bacteria in these. Now, that's the work of Douglas Cal. I'll talk about that in a future lecture, but there's more dormant bacteria than people widely recognize. And as soon as you say dormant bacteria, people think, oh, you know, what are you talking about? I've never heard that before. Think about it. Yes, you have. Everybody knows about the dormancy of bacteria like tuberculosis, the dormancy of syphilis like tertiary syphilis, the dormancy of Lyme disease like tertiary Lyme disease causing brain damage. And everybody knows about dormancy of viruses like herpes virus, okay? So there's a lot of information about common known dormancy and recurrence infections. And there's a whole bunch of other ones that are not widely known. So that's a topic for a future lecture. But dormant bacteria is a real thing. And they potentially come back to life when they're given a lot of iron, okay? That's why you don't want a lot of free iron in your blood. It's another reason amongst many you don't want high levels of iron, okay? They also, like I said, some, some viruses, they seem to sense your cortisol levels. So when you're really stressed out, that's when a person will get 
an episode, a reactivation of a cold sore or some other viral infection. Uh, risk of allergic reaction to transfusion. That's another potential problem. Risk of a viral infection. HIV used to be common in the past, but not anymore uh, with transfusions. It's like Arthur Ashe, the tennis player or something, I think, got that. The goal is to lower serum ferritin to about 50 to 100. Some people will want it even lower, but you get below 50, you might have restless leg syndrome, which you don't want. Um, check with your doctor to confirm blood donation is a reasonable idea for you. Um, check your blood tests before you start so you know where your hemoglobin's at and maybe a few other uh, iron indices if that's relevant for you. You definitely would want to know your serum ferritin level in advance. How low to go on your serum ferritin level if you're trying to donate blood to lower it. I let you work that out with your doctor. Um, some people think to go as low as 30 to 40. Other people say, oh no, not even in that ballpark. 100 to 150 is a good way to maintain it. Um, for a little perspective, I randomly checked mine a couple years ago and it was uh, about 240 and that was higher than I wanted. So I said, I'm gonna donate some blood. I donated some blood, not even that much, but I screwed up. I did it on a whim and I let some people draw my blood who were pretty inexperienced. And I felt lightheaded afterwards. I had to lay down for a while. I didn't hydrate. I should have eaten a big breakfast and been really well hydrated. You tolerate it better, the blood draw. And um, So anyways, it makes your veins easier so they have an easy time getting the blood out of your veins. Don't be in a hurry that day so you can lay around for a while. It's good to have somebody else drive you there. So you're in, don't be busy that day so you can lay around as much as you want and take it easy. You might feel a little tired afterwards. Um, by the way, Randall Laufer writes in his book, oh, he feels great after donation. He gets a donor's high. You know, maybe he did. I certainly didn't. I felt kind of crappy. That's why I haven't done it since then. But if I had to, like, let's say, let's say I was diagnosed with cancer. I'm not really worried about getting sick. I'm 58. I have no medical problems. My problem, I don't think, is because I'm sick. I might annoy somebody and they beat me up or something. That might be my problem in real life. But my health, I'm pretty confident about that with all this diet and stuff. Um... And so the reason I'm going through all that is for a person who really has a bad health problem, let's say newly diagnosed with cancer, they should check their serum ferritin level and consider maybe donating blood to lower that. That might help them. So then you'll sequester iron from your cancer or, or maybe for an infectious problem or something. So that's a more nuanced uh, topic, but there are real reasons to do it. And I can tell you some of the smartest people I've ever met in my life who are you know world-class uh, genius researchers, they donate blood a couple times a year for this exact reason. They want to lower their iron. But some of those guys, they're a little bit stupid about diet. What I mean by that is they'll eat meat and then their iron level keeps going back up so they donate blood. Eat meat, iron level goes back up, donate blood. My personality would be just don't eat meat so my iron levels stay low and then forget about it. So you don't have to go donate blood. Um, Lou Lawford complains that fainting is really rare, only in 1% or less of donors, but I don't know. Uh, like I said, I screwed up, but I think uh, it wasn't a great experience for me. My, my friend, though, who does it, he thinks it's fine and he doesn't bother him at all. You could also donate a small amount, a minimal volume donation. Ask in advance to make sure they allow that. Uh, 250 to 300 uh, milliliters, cc and milliliters, the same thing, cubic centimeter. Um, you, you can also have a standard don donage is about one pint, about 473 uh cubic centimeters, cc's, milliliters, but you know they list it as 450 to 500. All right, so that's the, the data on that. All right, so that's it for this uh, lecture number two on iron. I have additional lectures uh, coming up on iron.